I think I would have adopted at the time had you asked me as an atheist, I, I want nothing to do with faith anymore. Because this is the argument I get from atheists all the time when I talk to them. I don't have faith in anything. <laughs> Baloney. Unapologetic from Premier Unbelievable. Well, welcome to today's show. It's the first of two episodes featuring a relatively new voice in the world of Christian philosophy and apologetics. John D. Wise goes online as the Christian atheist. He's a philosophy professor by background who was an atheist for nearly 25 years and he underwent a quite remarkable conversion or reconversion to Christianity in 2019. It's a story he's been exploring through his podcast, The Christian Atheist, for the last year or more. Uh, so welcome along to the show, John. Great to have you with me. Oh, fantastic to be here. I appreciate the opportunity very much. I've I've been listening to your story with really great interest. Um, you you tell it very well in this new podcast that you started last year, The Christian Atheist. Tell us first of all, though, it's it's a kind of paradoxical title for a podcast. Why why did you choose The Christian Atheist? <laughs> because it is paradoxical. In, in fact, um, probably the most common comment I get when I have when I have conversations on Facebook or something is that uh, I'm an oxymoron. <laughs> and I guess that's uh -huh. probably true. I'm definitely a moron in one way or another. So an oxymoron <laughs> may be the best, the best way to be. Um, but paradox <laughs> really centers everything that I do. It was, as I say in the first few episodes of The Christian Atheist, paradox was what drove me away. Because Christianity seemed to me, at the end of my tenure in Bible college, to be no longer intellectually defensible. It seemed as though the rationality that I was exploring at the time said to me, no, this doesn't make sense. All you've been doing these past four years in Bible college is trying to convince yourself that this is true, and you don't believe it. And eventually that won. Mm. <laughs> um, but... Ultimately, right. it turned around on yeah. me. It became a two-edged sword. Yeah. Yeah, interesting. Well, we'll get to all of that in due course. Um, tell us about, um, you know, what life looked like growing up. I think you kind of grew up with a Christian faith as, as a young man. You sort of even were entertaining sort of seminary and possible ministry Correct. ambitions. So, so, so tell us about that and, and, and how the story changed for you. Yeah, I, I grew up in a, a household that was a divided household. So my father had fought in World War II, was at Pearl Harbor when it was hit. Um, and so I grew up with a family in, in which my father was very much sort of an agnostic who was very rational. He was a, a carpenter. And so I grew up <laughs> learning to use my hands and to think because at, at, our, um, at our dinners, we would always sit around and dad would have some sort of thing, something to talk about. And we were expected to contribute to the conversation. My mother was an evangelical Christian. Um, and early on in my life, I mean, she had Christian radio on 24 um, seven. I, I adopted that. I said, okay, this makes sense to me. I think I'm going to give my life to Christ. And so I did four or five, six years old, somewhere around there. And uh, it was very real to me all through my childhood. And um, as I graduated from high school, I said to myself, good, I'm going to go to Bible college and I'm going to become a pastor. And as I began to study, um, am I going beyond your, your question here? Um, no, no, okay. please. Yeah. Tell us about what happened, because that, that's that. Yeah, this it was really while you were in Bible college that you started to get a lot of questions, wasn't right. it? Right. So I decided to become a pastor um, and I did several missions trips while I was in Bible college. And it just became clear to me as I went on and on um, that I was performing something that I couldn't justify. And it became almost an arrogance for me. And, and I mean, ar arrogance is usually something that shows you don't really have a good grasp on what it is you think, and therefore you cover it with, um, you know, a sense of, I'm going, to, I'm going to really get this. And so I studied apologetics mm. like crazy because I didn't mm. think I really understood it well enough to be able to defend it. But I spent most mm. of my Bible college career defending it. We did a lot of evangelism, mm. going mm. out into the streets. I was mm. in New York City. I went to Jamaica three, to 
two times, mm. two or three times to Jamaica. Mm. Um, and so we did a lot of evangelism in Bible college. And I was, a, I was an evangelistic leader in the college. And um, then I started studying philosophy with one of my professors there. And um, as time went on, by the time I graduated from Bible college, I was getting to the point that this was starting to seem intellectually problematic for me because the people that I was reading, and I read a lot of philosophy at the time, um, were beginning to point me away from this. And it didn't seem as rational to me as I wanted things to be. And so I, when I graduated from Bible college, finally, uh, I came to think to myself, well, this doesn't, I, I just can't defend it. And so I slid towards agnosticism and I had been married at the time. I married someone mm. that I met in Bible college. Um, and this was, of course, devastating to her. But I, I slipped towards agnosticism and it was no longer a viable path to become a pastor. So mm. I had four years of college under mm. my belt that would do me no good in the practical world. <laughs> and so I yeah. decided to follow the passion that I developed with one of my professors at Bible college on philosophy. And I started a graduate program um, and to cut it a little shorter so I don't go too long. Um, eventually I, I slid into agnosticism completely because it was the one absolutely defensible position. I, I still believe that to this day. Mm. Mm. You don't know whether mm. God exists. Mm. You don't know whether God doesn't mm. exist. That's mm. what faith is about. Mm. Um, and, and so mm. I, I was in graduate school pursuing my PhD at the University of California, Irvine. And I woke up one day and was walking across campus to class. And it just struck me. There's no God. There's no God. Mm. And from that point forward, for the next 25 years, essentially, 24, 25 years, I just stopped believing. Wow. So that was how it slid off. Yeah. So before we start to talk about the journey that you went on in the latter part of those 24 years, um, take us to 2019, which was the point at which suddenly things started to come together. You described this moment you know, quite eloquently in the podcast as a looking glass moment, as though you're looking into a mirror yes. and there's a kind of, decision almost about whether you're going to step across to the other side of this looking glass in a kind of Alice in Wonderland kind of way. Tell us, tell us about that metaphor and, and what that moment was about, why you had arrived at that particular point in 2019. Okay. My, my first wife was diagnosed with Parkinson's in 2013. And um, we found out in 2015 that it was a misdiagnosis that she actually had Lewy body dementia. And she had declined at that point um, to, the, to the point that she really couldn't be at home anymore. And so I lost her to a home. Um, and then the next four years, excuse my language, was hell. Um, mm. it, was, mm. it was traveling back and forth, spending as much time as I could there with her. Um, we had adopted a daughter in 2011. Um, and uh, it, was, it was just brutal. Um, to, to try to get through this. And it was a difficult marriage in itself. So mm. Um, mm. adding that on top of it at the end, um, I, it was hard to maintain my job. Um, mm. I had act I'd stopped teaching back in 2013 when she was diagnosed and I, I became a, uh, a me auto mechanic um, so I could be home and still do the things mm. I needed to do. Um, but I was beginning to get to the point where that was closing down too on me and everything yeah. was starting to fall apart. Um, and then my wife eventually in 2019, in February of 2019 died. Um, and during the, the five years before my wife and I had started going to a local church because my wife was still a Christian and I supported mm. that and had no problem with mm. it. So I, I continued to go with, to church with her there and she made me promise that we would that I would continue to raise our daughter in in the church, um, and so I continued at church. And um, one day, um, a, a woman came in who had a, a husband who was going through cancer, and um, and I offered to take him to one of his uh, last one of his final treatments, and. Um, 
this woman and I became very close friends because we were going through exactly the same thing, losing our spouses at the same time. Hmm. And so for the next, what, was that 2017, Jenny? So I got in 2017. For the next two and a half years, we were texting a lot um, just as friends um, hmm. and sharing the things that we were going through. And quickly, she became probably the best friend I've ever had in my life. Um, but nothing more. That's, that's mm -hmm. all it was. Um, but she was a Christian and, you know, a full member of the church. And so I knew it could never be anything more than that. I grew up in a Christian home. Mm -hmm. I knew that unequally yoked is something that could never happen. Um, and therefore she was not for me something that I would allow myself to think of as any more mm -hmm. than mm -hmm. just a friend. Um, unfortunately things don't always <laughs> work out the way we plan in our minds. And Jenny became oh, an ideal for me. Mm. Um, mm. She became kind of the woman that I had never had in my married life. Um, I saw the devotion that she had to her kids as she lost her husband. Um, I saw the strength and the power that she had in, in Christ and holding on to that um, through everything. And in that, I saw my own failures and weaknesses. So she became for me a looking glass, a mirror mm. that held up to me my own inadequacies adequacies and failures. Um, when my wife died, um, I started trying to think, okay, I, I don't want to be alone the rest of my life. I joined a, a dating site. Um, that, that may seem really sudden, but I mean, I'd spent five years without my wife in the home. So sure. mm. <laughs> Anyway, yeah. it was what it was. I did what I did. I'm not real proud of it now. But yeah. um, I, I was looking for someone. I needed someone. Um, and as time passed, uh, every woman I would look at, every woman I would correspond with wasn't Jenny. And it became clear that what I really, really wanted, and of course Jenny had no idea at this point, I had done almost everything to push her away. If you hear her side of the story, mm -hmm. she's like, this guy... He has absolutely nothing to do with me other than to text once in a while. And and that was <laughs> never true because I was always mm, fascinated mm, with her and thrilled with mm, her. Mm. Um, but eventually it got to the point in, in July of 2019 that I she was talking about some of the difficulties in her life. And I said, well, then you should marry me. And she looked at me and she said, you know what, John, if you were a Christian now, I would marry you tomorrow. And that devastated me because now mm. I felt, <laughs> and you have to know the overweening super ego with which I deal. <laughs> I felt now I had trapped her in a situation where <laughs> we both had acknowledged something that is dangerous for both of us. And, yeah. uh, and I saw it as a trap, uh, you know, not a trap, yeah. as yeah. something that I needed to fight and overcome. And, and, but what could I do? I had no idea what I could do. What I'd, I'd like to do is sort of, you know, I guess sketch out some of the intellectual issues that were kind of going on in the background, you know, right. that led up to this this moment of, you know, crisis, as it were, um, in 2019. It's interesting the way you describe it in the podcast that you um, you kind of made this conscious decision for agnosticism, but then you know ended up kind of thinking of yourself as an atheist ultimately um and and i think you i think you you kind of came to see actually that generally life is not a faith free place in fact <laughs> even in the secular world and academy there were people who were committed to essentially faith positions even if they weren't typically religious ones and and you you t tell us about that experience what what were you seeing that was kind of making you realize that yeah people weren't simply logical you know, rational creatures that we, we all have our biases in one, one way or another. Yeah. Well, in, yeah, I mean, Lewis, C.S. Lewis talks about a surprise by joy, how all the books turned against him. And so before I actually talk about the people and, and that played a huge role too, because I, I looked at academia, just mm. as you're pointing to there, I, when I, when I turned my life from agnosticism to atheism, when I took that final step, I took it because I said to myself, it's cowardly to stand on the fence, choose one or the other. Hmm. Um, and, and for me, I, I grew up with C.S. Lewis, so the, the Chronicles of Narnia were huge. 
And in The Magician's Nephew, the wood between the worlds represented for me that agnosticism, standing nowhere, going nowhere, mm. falling asleep, mm. and making no progress. Mm. So I said, choose <laughs> a side. So I said, Ag agnosticism, fine, that's the defensible position. I say there is no God, because that's where mm. I pretty much had come to. So I said, I'm just going mm. to go there. And so mm. I followed it. And I said to myself, academia will now be my church, for lack of a better term. I think I would have adopted at the time, had you asked me as an atheist, I, don't, I want nothing to do with faith anymore. Because this mm. is the argument I get from atheists all the time when I talk to them. Mm. I don't have faith in anything. <laughs> Baloney. <laughs> you cannot live as a human being without having faith. It's impossible. Because we as human beings, and this I learned from Socrates, we don't know much of anything. And I imbibed that deeply from Socrates as I began teaching my intro to philosophy courses at the um, uh, at say East Stroudsburg University in Pennsylvania. Um, and that became one of the, the touchstones for my life and my career moving forward, recognizing that we are all fundamentally ignoramuses. We are so fundamentally limited in time and space that we can claim knowledge about almost nothing. Mm. Um, mm. And then I read Jean-Paul Sartre for my dissertation. And I do like I do everything. I tend to do it to the extremes. <laughs> and so I, I mean, I went through being in nothingness, which is almost a thousand page work with a fine tooth comb, read everything, understood everything. And that's a pretty hard thing to do with Sartre. Uh, <laughs> but I became convinced from studying Sartre for my dissertation that he himself claimed that atheism was faith. Mm. When he said that, when I saw that in one of his little red essays, um, it, it struck me and I thought, wait a second, really? Is it mm. really? Mm. And then I started asking myself, are you really, is this a faith? And I had to agree with him. But that wasn't enough to turn me back because so what? If we mm. all live as faith, why is one faith better than another? Mm. And I knew enough about Christianity and I knew enough about atheism that there was nothing on either side rationally mm. to make the final decision in terms of making a case. Mm. To this day, I believe that. I, I believe there is, I think atheists are extremely rational. I think, I, I think they're hyper rational and that's mm. the problem. They take rationality too far um, and, and, and they believe in the stories they make up in their head rather than in the reality presented to them in in the world in which we live mm. um, so I, i'm not sure if i fully addressed what you were yeah, asking there. that no that, that that's helpful um i mean i know that one of your favorite philosophers and someone you've taught on with your students is kant and mm -hmm. and what what did kind of kant bring to this kind of conversation on faith and reason and that sort of thing right so <clears throat> like like Plato and Socrates, Kant is one of the dividing points in philosophy. I mean, you have pre-Kantian philosophy and post-Kantian philosophy. So Kant is kind of like one of the watershed moments. And my advisor in graduate school was Armando Benchivenga, and he has some rather controversial views about Kant. But studying with him convinced me that he had the right view on Kant. And one of the things that Kant said just reinforced what I had already learned from Socrates. He said, I had to limit the pretensions of reason to make room for faith. That is, Kant agreed with Sartre, who came much later, or I should say Sartre agreed with Kant, that faith is at the basis of everything human beings do, and that rationality needs to find its proper niche in our role in life. Mm. Um, and finding that in Kant for me was like another one of those mind shattering moments. And, and mm. then tracing out the implications of it um, was for me, again, one of those things that helped me understand and put in perspective the broader picture that I needed to, um, to move back to faith in God. Yeah. Although at the time, that wasn't at all what I was thinking. Yeah, yeah. And, and none of this was, in a sense, at that time, moving you towards christianity i guess these were right. more kind of ideas but none of it sort of suggested that you know you were going to move back to theism much less you know christianity at that point i mean it's right. interesting though just sticking with this 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 thing about reason and 
faith um and i think you you you've been quite influenced by jonathan Haidt, um the psychologist yeah. and 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 he's got this interesting analogy hasn't he about the the elephant and the rider and the fact that a lot of the time people go around thinking that their their reason is kind of driving you know their decisions and you know the things they choose to do right. and i think that's the the kind of the way that maybe a lot of atheists think about things you know i'm, I'm just following my reason you know just following the evidence and so on but but i i think interestingly points out that actually a lot of the time we're using our reason simply to support uh, what it is we actually already believe that the elephant under us that's actually taking us in the direction that it's deciding right. and that is going to be yeah. a combination of your worldview your background religious sort of you know commitments um ethical commitments uh, kind of just the, the gut kind of instinct you have about things um so do you want to talk about that because does that does that relate to this idea that that ultimately reason is kind of services actually something else very often not not and isn't necessarily the driving force for a second on height um what i love about jonathan height is he himself takes a position he's still quite far to the left nevertheless mm. he tries to be objective and i think that is something that we all fail to do i mean most of us fail to even try but at least we can recognize that every one of us is a motivated reasoner that is, we tend to take mm. a position on something first and then find reasons in support of that. Um, one of the reasons I chose the Christian Atheist is that I have, an, in that name, um, a real claim, and I think it is, to the fact that I have both of these people in my tool chest to pull from. I understand the atheist position from the inside. I believed it. I was a firm believer. I thought there was no mm. chance of my ever coming back to God, which is what terrified me with Jenny. Because I wanted Jenny so badly mm. that it's like, okay, <laughs> now what? I can't flip that switch. She needs a Christian, and I can't give her that. So what do I do? So mm. that motivated mm. reasoning thing is absolutely critical to understanding who we are as human beings. Um, and so I try, I really do try to give honest assessment on both sides and see the strength of the argument. And because I've been on both sides, both sides of the looking glass here, I mm. call it, um, I really can see the argument. Usually the atheists that I argue with, I could make the position better than they make it. <laughs> but, um, um, and I try to do as well as I can with the Christian argument, but I've been away from Christianity for 25 years. And so mm. I'm coming back under a bit of a deficit. Yeah. Like you had John Lennox on the other day and he's probably like really big right now. I never heard of John Lennox until this year. So I had yeah. no idea yeah, who yeah. he was. The Zacharias, yeah, yeah. I learned that he died. I knew nothing about him. So right. it's all of the people that have been, <laughs> you know, hauling the cart while I've been away. I'm like completely ignorant of. So yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm and, in my pants. But in a, in a way that, that, gives you a refreshingly different perspective on this which is one of the reasons i i was interested in, in bringing you on because and we'll, we'll talk about this in the next show a bit more john but you're you're not a typical apologist you're not kind of coming in with a kind of set of you know uh you know theoretical you know hypotheses and you know that you're not you're not the next william lane craig let's say um so <laughs> so we'll, we'll we'll talk about this because um we we'll just call it enter today's episode and and next week we'll find out what brought you across the line um and what what exactly that journey entailed because it's it is it is an interesting one and it's a bit different actually um so uh so thank you for joining me on this week's episode and uh, do come back again next week to hear more of john's story the christian atheist and why after nearly 25 years as an atheist professor of philosophy he found god again in 2019 uh, do join us again next time for now thank you very much john for being my guest thanks for having me unapologetic from premier unbelievable for more shows resources and our newsletter visit premierunbelievable.com